Hacksters, welcome to another Tuesday. It's a Hackster Cafe, my favorite time of the week where we get to interview someone who's doing really cool stuff with technology. This week's guest is Michelle Scherer, who also goes by Mickey, and uh, by her own description, is a software engineer pursuing creativity, currently learning about LEDs and posting about it online on michellesh.com, which is linked below, as is her Hackster profile, which is where we first found out about your work. Welcome, Michelle. How's it going? It's going so good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Uh, and I noticed that you have one of these texture projects in the background behind you. So why don't we start there? Tell us about yeah. your plant. Yes. So this is a snake plant um, that twinkles and it's made of a uh, steel rod welded together and then yarn wrapped around that with LED strips embedded and rocks in the pot, which is hard to see from this angle. but. The rocks seem um, necessary to keep it from tipping over, huh? Yes, definitely. That was that was part of the inspiration. Although this pot is bigger than I planned, and so hmm. it got really heavy. Um, so actually, the bottom like half of the pot is foam. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So you got a published project for this. Would you like to tell us what it's uh, running on and how you ended up building it? Yeah, um, it is running on an ESP32, um, which. I don't, it doesn't actually utilize any Wi Fi, but maybe someday it could. And I like building things with ESP32s because then I could possibly use Wi Fi in the future. But, mm. um, but yeah, there are, yeah, there's NeoPixels. Um, there's 300 of them total. Whoa. And um, yeah, the project was inspired by buying a house and not being able to keep plants alive in general um, and wanting to decorate the house with LEDs. Um, <laughs> So this will be a good like living room piece. This is so cool. I have a similar issue with not being allowed to have pets. And so I oh. built robots <laughs> instead. Um, nice. Same kind of idea. But uh, so you, you not only designed this, but you also welded it together. So you have all these different disciplines that you're bringing together. You've got electronics, you've got fabric, textile arts, you've got welding. Uh, Tell us about how you bring together all your different interests uh, in your work. And are there any other interests that you have that sort of find their way into the hardware stuff that you're building? Oh, yeah, totally. It, it always happens that way. It's like I get excited to try a new skill and then my next project tends to incorporate it. So like that with this, I have always wanted to learn welding. And I was like, this is a great opportunity to learn to weld and um, you know, it seems like a pretty approachable welding task. Um, and the same thing with the rib cage, which I had always wanted to get into wood carving. So I like incorporated wood carving there. Um, but yeah, I love learning new skills. And I think for my next one, I want to learn 3D printing because I've never done that before. But I feel like it has so many uses in with LEDs. So yeah, so you've got all these sort of handmade, very sort of tactile art forms that you're working with already, and then you're sort of looking to dive into CAD. So you want to get into 3D printing. Are there any other sort of digital fabrication techniques that you're interested in learning? Like, for example, for this kind of thing, you could use a CNC router, but you use a jigsaw uh, and like this. hand carving. I can't think of anything. I, I'm very new to all of this. Like, most of my background is software, and so mm -hmm. like this is me kind of breaking into the sculpture <laughs> three-dimensional world tell us about that how does um how do you think that software has has it prepared you at all for this kind of work or do you find that it's very, very different i guess so far i felt like it's really different writing code is sort of my comfort zone and so it's it's nice to imagine what i could do with leds and then that sort of builds an, a vision for what i could build and then i sort of make it as easy as i possibly can from there uh to work with and so it's kind of like a good starting place. Um, and I'm excited to see where it could go from here as yeah. I like learn new hardware skills and sculpture and stuff. <laughs> so let's dig into that a little bit. Uh, how did you first get started into uh, electronics? What were your first steps? Because a lot of our people on our site are software people, software people, you know, people who uh, are sort of have a lot of expertise in software, but want to get their hands dirty with hardware. And so mm. you being sort of a prime example of this, how did you first dig in? Yeah, so it all started with uh, installations, like larger scale installations. Um, the first installation that I worked on was Betsy was this top one um, in 2019. And basically, so 
we built this project for Burning Man and we didn't at first have the idea to like incorporate LEDs at all, but we like a friend and I were working on this and we came up with the idea to do an LED ceiling. And um, at first we were just gonna use like some sort of um, software that exists already, like LED labs, I think is one of them that mm. you can just like, you don't have to write any of the code, you can just design it. But since I had a background in software engineering, I kind of wanted to try programming everything from scratch. <laughs> mm. um, and I had, I had used an Arduino like once or twice in college. And so I just bought one and I started like looking up how to use it on the internet. Uh -huh. um, and it just all worked out. <laughs> I love this photo of everyone dancing with the LEDs. Uh, yeah, that was. We were able to get such a perfect grid on here as well. What kinds of uh, Arduinos were you using in college? What were you doing with them? Uh, in college, I I don't even remember. It was probably a class, um, a class that like I don't know. I'm sure it was an Arduino Uno or something. Uh, this the Bet Betsy. This ceiling runs off of an Arduino Dewey. Is that I'm not sure mm. if that's how you pronounce it, but uh, the one of the bigger ones. I actually didn't write this on the website, but I recently, like last year, I think it was, I added an N64 controller ah! um, to control the the ceiling lights um so you can like sit under and it's wireless you can sit under it and like push buttons and control the light patterns i should do a write-up on that i haven't done that yeah is that also running on an esp32 because I, I didn't know if the duo had like wireless or did you did you change the microcontroller did you add like a wireless module on it i i probably did this in like a super silly way because i didn't know what i was doing but uh there's an arduino running the lights for betsy and i i just wired an esp8266 directly to the arduino and mm -hmm. then the n64 controller also runs in an arduino or sorry yeah an arduino and then i also wired another 80 8266 to that um so that the one that's wired to the n64 controller sends messages to the one that's wired to the ceiling. <laughs> um, I've it totally worked, it worked out in that. that. That's, not, that's not that silly. <laughs> <laughs> totally valid. Uh, so you've also built a couple of other large installations. You've got this dance floor and put lights on this solar saucer. Super cool. Is that like a, a crashed alien ship? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, the, the solar saucer is an art car that has been around for years. Um, I think it was built in like 2008 or 10 or I don't know. It's been around for a while um, and it had lights on it. But uh, a friend and I just like revamped all the lights and we put on addressable LEDs and um, mounted them wow. on there and coded them. And there's also uh, it was either at the beginning or the end of this video. There's a, we built a wireless controller for this too. That um, like a the person thing. who built the saucer, <laughs> he built it, and it's like two hubcaps sandwiched together um, with like buttons and switches all embedded in there, and you can control the lights with that and just pass it around. <laughs> I love that. It says it's powered by solar panels. Uh, did you work on the solar system? The solar system at all? The solar no that was yeah all of that was already in place um when we started the lights for there we go here's the controller yeah that's it <laughs> that's like one of those uh insulators from a, a power tower whatever you call them <laughs> my grandpa used to collect those the the glass things are like insulators they're such a cool like alien shape i love these things yeah. and they really give a nice little touch and what about this one the dance floor yeah, we uh, we actually renamed that one uh, to Prism, um, but this was like a big group effort. Uh, like it's a huge, huge piece and um, lots of people were helping with this. And I was mostly focused on just programming the lights and doing the soldering. Um, but yeah, there are four like triangle shaped fabric sails with um, oh. like LED channels that we like slid these super duper long LED strips with a fish um, through which was just like really difficult, but we, we got it, got them in there. And, <laughs> um, and they're all, each sale has, also has an 80, an ESP8266, like each one has its own. And then there's also a wireless controller for this, which I don't have a picture of on my website. Um, is that described as a treasure chest? 
Yeah, it's like this, I didn't build it. It was built by a friend uh, for like another project. We ended up uh -huh. reusing it for this project, but it's just like the tiny treasure chest and you flip it open and there's like arcade buttons inside. Nice. Um, and they control the lights. Well, it is a time-honored tradition to cannibalize parts of one project to feed another. <laughs> always, always. <laughs> You mentioned you did a ton of soldering for these projects. What would be your one or two tips for people who are just getting started with soldering? Hmm. Uh, gosh, I think probably one of the top tips I have is to just do it over and over and over again, because that's the best way that I learned. Like all the LEDs for Betsy, um, we soldered individually and there it was just a lot of soldering. And I think that a lot of practice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and get like all your favorite tools I feel like are really important too like having a good soldering iron really leveled up my soldering game <laughs> do you have a favorite soldering iron the one I have I don't know the model name but it's a hacko mm. I started out with just the one from Home Depot for a long time and then upgraded to this one and it was a good it was a good choice nice yes it's know. the one on the left there with the oh, cool yeah that's the one yeah they do a lot of giveaways so people if you want to follow Hako, you might end up getting something like this they also make the omni device which is a wonderful device for clamping work pieces while you're soldering on them yeah so um as we talked about you learned to do some welding and stuff do you have any top any tips for people who are building electronics that want to do some welding are there any special considerations for when you're making something like because you're wiring stuff around it right led lights is there anything special that you had to do with the welding to make sure that it would play nice with the electronics um i mean after i welded it i like filed it down so it wasn't mm. all like grabby i did use uh this isn't really welding related at all but i did use threaded rod here which mm. added a lot of friction which is really helpful for like a lot of reasons it makes um, sense with the uh the yarn you probably need it to sort of keep it in place huh totally this looks yes. so cool but yeah no welding i mean welding i guess it's not as hard as i thought it would be i was really intimidated by it um but yeah if, if you find a good teacher and a community i don't know yeah. I would love to learn about welding. I love that you built, uh, bought a special uh, drill bit specifically for doing this project. Oh yeah, it was worth it. It was so worth it. It totally <laughs> is. And then you see the little power switch uh, embedded in the rock. It's it's magical. I was yeah, actually wondering if that was like a real rock and now I know that it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's take a look at your sound reactive rib cage a little bit more. Yeah, just tell us about your process with building this guy. I know that we talked about the wood part, but what about the electronics? The electronics um, was probably my favorite part. Ooh. I like, well, I gosh, every single part of this project is my favorite <laughs> part. Um, but yeah, wiring all the stuff underneath the underneath the base was just like I think I I struggled a lot with the wood because it was like all new to me. And so when I finally got to the to the like soldering, I was just stoked to like be in a comfortable place um and yeah I, I i think there's a picture down there of um like the wiring mm -hmm. i think i i had it in my head that i was gonna make it like beautiful and it doesn't look as beautiful as i had pictured <laughs> it's kind of gorgeous and it's underneath the bottom of the platform right mm -hmm. yeah totally I think um, from the top, it looks absolutely gorgeous. What is this uh, loop on here? Is that from oh, the wire routing? Yeah, so there's another loop on the left of the mm -hmm. same picture that's smaller, and it's like holding the wires on. Are these the base. recycled bike inner tubes? Yeah, they are. I they love that. Bike. <laughs> you for so many materials. things. So these feet on here, are those also sort of upcycled materials, or are they something that you bought specifically as furniture feet? or? Yeah, I bought I bought them at Home Depot. I I didn't know what to use for the feet, and I was I just walked around Home Depot and like looked at things that might work. And I wanted it to be heavy so that it was like really solid base so the rib cage wouldn't fall over. And this that was just when I saw these, I was like, oh, that's that's it. <laughs> I like your strategy here for uh, pulling together all the ends of things. Is this two sizes of heat shrink, or is this like a crimped on end and then you put heat shrink over it? Yeah, and then it's hot glue in the end. Yeah, yes, exactly. It's crimped with like a little bit of string tube and then squirt hot glue in. I love <laughs> I, that technique as well. Uh, really? Okay. 
That's so cool because I was wondering if that was just a really weird way to do it, but it works every time. I mean, it's something that I also sort of just like decided to do one day and it worked really nicely. Like it, it shrinks the heat shrink and it gets a really good seal because you know that it's like compressing down on the glue. It's, I think it's great. I've never seen it done with these crimps, so I love that. It seems a lot more stable than the sort of screw on terminals that you see uh, connectors that are you know not really trusted by anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it seems pretty stable um this way for sure sometimes i also solder it as well i'll like solder the bundle together and then crimp it and then heat shrink it just for like mm. total durability so tell us uh what are these potentiometers controlling they are controlling um different things so the left one does full brightness of just like the overall all the leds so the button cycles through the patterns mm. and the middle one changes the settings for that pattern and then the right one changes the color nice well it came up looking gorgeous do you have any tips for making it look so sort of polished and refined one thing that you did uh clearly is go through and take this sort of bundle of lights and wrapped it into a really beautiful sort of star shape um where they were a little bit more tidy are there any other tips that you have for taking a, a prototype and turning it into something that looks a little bit more finished I think um, I think the thing for, that worked for me here was to just not like get caught up in what it should look like and just try something. Mm. Um, so like the first one, I was like, yeah, it's going to be a bundle. Um, mm. How about if I just wrap it around around a pipe? I don't know. And then I just like made it and I was like, yeah, that's good enough. And then I got inspired to do the next thing. I don't think I would have had the idea for the atom shape um, if I hadn't done that like twisty spirally bundle um because when i saw it i was like oh i could do it this new way so just like trying stuff this is something that i wonder about uh whether it sort of translates between software work and hardware stuff i feel like there are obviously professional engineers who will design something from the ground up and then build it exactly as it's designed and that's totally a valid way to work especially when you're collaborating with people but um th there is this whole like as you go sort of creative element that i think um comes up more when you're uh, especially when you're building like the first version of something maybe on the second and third version there's less of that but um how does this compare with your experience with software because from the, an outside perspective um it seems that sort of professional software is constantly being iterated uh and do you feel like there's similarities or differences in the processes there yes definitely i love that question <laughs> uh, because i'm not sure that i really would have put that together myself but yes absolutely like when i was writing code for the tree of light prototype um, a lot of it was and betsy too basically every time i'm coding leds the process is just like let's see what happens if i do this and then you just see what it looks like and you're like oh but if it was like this that would be cooler and it's just this like process that builds and builds um which is what i love about coding and about coding things that end up like being visual things like like I started as a as a front end web developer so I think that's where it all got started <laughs> mm. and uh tell us a bit more about what you how you started putting this together what are these pieces here yeah those are plexiglass discs um that were just we had a big sheet of plexiglass that we just cut into circles with a jigsaw and then there's also like thick plexiglass um to to hold the discs onto that wooden dowel they um, almost also look like these vertebrae that you have on here if i can find them the like discs in between the the ribs on here yeah totally i think the design was yeah in my head as i was doing the second of the page <laughs> so uh have you used cad before i realize that I think maybe you said that someone else on your team put this one together uh, and I'm curious because there's like Fusion 360, there's uh, Onshape, there's Rhino, there's SolidWorks, there's all these other ones. I have never used any of the tools that you just mentioned. Okay. I'm super excited to learn any of them though. <laughs> you did mention that you want to get into 3D printing next. Have you ever tried Tinkercad? No. Uh, I've heard of it though. Yeah. Uh, it's not the most precise tool, but it's very uh, nice for sort of getting started with putting some shapes together. 
Also, I personally want to learn Blender next because I want to do more like visual stuff, but I've found great oh, cool. success with Fusion 360 and Onshape for physical modeling. Oh, there's so many options though. I'm really Yeah, I was going to say how do you here. choose how do you choose which one to start with? Honestly, I think part of it is just aesthetics, like what tools sort of match your intuition for how something should be put together. Tinkercad is very much like here's a shape and here's another shape that I'm going to use to sort of sculpt that shape to like cut another shape out of it or add another shape onto it whereas a lot of other tools have more of like a, a sketching situation and then you like extrude that shape or like rotate that shape uh, or multiply that shape and then like turn it into uh, into 3D objects from a 2D design and then other ones where you're just you're using basically pure math <laughs> to put stuff together um, but wow. Cool. Back to you, though. We talked about soldering irons before. Is there another tool that you love using? Uh, yes. I have so many favorite tools. And I love this question because I get really emotionally attached to my tools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's it's all about, like, processes, I think. Like, if I have really, like, a process, then I have, like, tools that I use for that process. Um, like, I, I love taking the header pins off of boards like that process of um like I think I, I have an ESP32 here um so like taking these rows off I love I have these like little wire snippers and I use those to like cl to clip all of the plastic pieces the like black part Mm -hmm. And then I have um, I have one of those like helping hand soldering iron setups where you like can like prop it up. And then I have these like really tiny needle nose pliers. Pretty much any tool, if it's really tiny, it's like my favorite tool. <laughs> like a really tiny stuff is my favorite. Um, and I use the needle nose pliers to like so to in the soldering iron to like get the, the pins out. And then I have a solder sucker to get the through holes clear. And that whole process, like if I if it's time to get the header pins out of a board that's like the most the best part of my day <laughs> <laughs> i can see why honestly because like using the solder sucker is so satisfying um <laughs> just like when you hit that button and feel the plunger like retract and then all of a sudden it's like and the yeah. uh you know and ejecting the bits of solidified solder from the tube is also very satisfying uh mm -hmm. it's just a ton of fun <laughs> totally yeah definitely you get it it's the best <laughs> now uh, why are you usually detaching the headers from a board because i know that i have reasons to do that sometimes but i'm curious like what you're doing it for yes i am doing it um i would love to know why other people do it as well or or don't do it um because this is just like kind of how i figured out how to do stuff um on my own and so i have these things which are just like oh, screw terminals. Little, yeah, exactly. And so I want to get them on here because then I oh. can easily swap out pins um, instead of like I, I did. There was a time where I was soldering wires directly to the board, mm -hmm. um, and they would rip. Like especially like on the prism, the like dance floor, like the sails would like flap in the wind, and these would just oh. like rip out. Um, and so I started using these screw terminals to yeah like the, the exact same that thing uh to just make it really easy to like swap out a wire or if that pin wasn't working for some reason then i can switch it to a different pin um that yeah. makes total sense you know having taken stuff out to the desert and had you know the hot glue melt for example and having to re-solder something because suddenly my strain relief was gone um being able to just plug it back in uh, from after a physical trauma seems that seems really clever. Uh, yeah, and you've also got them pointed toward the center, which is very interesting to me. Um, is that also a sort of strain relief kind of thing, or that was mostly because of the thing I mentioned earlier of trying to make this look really nice and like tidy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I wanted to make them kind of like all pointing in the same direction and be like really concise. Um, I have done it like the other way too, which is a lot easier to install. <laughs> <laughs> but this way is trying to make it look pretty. I also like how because you use the red and black and also blue uh, wires. There's green ones too, but they're kind of hidden. Uh, but the red and blue going into this microcontroller really reminds me of the sort of diagrams of an anatom anatomical heart uh, with mm, the, nice. the oxygenated yeah. and deoxygenated blood coming in. 
<laughs> totally. I never thought of that, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's another project that you've published as well, which is this little D&D mini platform. This is so cute. <laughs> and uh, yeah, tell us about how you built this. More wood this was actually a, um, a video I saw on SparkFun. I, I like this almost like the exact concept um, that I just saw. And you know, when you just like see a project built by someone else and you're just like, that is so cool that I have to have it or like I have to make it. Oh, yeah, there it yes. is. Um, and I just got super excited and I was like really into D&D at the time. Um, so I just made it. And I also wanted to try out wood carving and I had bought a wood carving knife. So I was like, mm. I'll just carve the little block piece. Um, and so, yeah, it was a really quick project and it was just really fun, every part of it. I like this little diagram that you made. Uh, yeah, I did it in Procreate on my iPad. Love Procreate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are there any mm, future projects that you can tell us about? I understand if you're like, want to keep it to yourself. People have different processes. Some people want to like post every step of the way. Some people want to like save it until it's like a real thing so that you don't lose your motivation. I'm one of those, <laughs> but yeah. I have so many ideas for things to do um, and none of them are like really refined enough to share um, because I don't know exactly what I'm gonna build, but I do have a bunch of like goals that feel pretty solid to like directions to move in. Um, like when I built the snake plant, I really enjoyed working with the welding and metal and yarn and everything, but I really missed working with wood while I was doing it. And so mm. I think I'm going to go back to wood for my next project. Um, and then another thing is I, I think my next project, I want to be more focused on code um, or at least a lot more time spent on the code as well as on the sculpture, because I recently posted on my Instagram uh, a bunch of videos of the tree of light prototype and I got like so much positive feedback mm. about the light patterns and it made me really excited to do more like coding focus because that one was much more coding focused it's not terribly beautiful to look at without the light on <laughs> um, and then and since then I had kind of transitioned to doing like sculpture with like less focus on code um, and so yeah I want my next project to be like both both code focused and pretty to look at without the lights on, like some sort of combination. Mm, yeah. um, and I'm really enjoying making things that are, I wanna do more plants after the snake <laughs> plants are fun. And I really, I also wanna do like body parts, like the rib cage, like pretty much combinations of plants and body parts is where my mind's at right now. Very <laughs> biological focus. Mm -hmm. I feel like the algorithms that you're writing for lighting these things also give it almost a living, breathing feeling uh, that feels quite naturalistic. Like this kind of reminds me of leaves changing color, uh, even though it's kind of in the reverse from autumn, but like something like growing and blooming from the bottom up and also turning yellow. Uh, yeah, totally. So lovely. This pattern or that the previous pattern was just it was actually called bloom. So I'm glad oh. that it gave you those absolutely <laughs> are you writing these yourself mm -hmm. they're so cool thanks they're all on my github <laughs> yeah and uh so we can find those can did you share here we go yep that's the one so everybody can follow we'll put this link in the description as well you can go find michelle's uh, oh who is this no that's my cat <laughs> his name is rocco that is an excellent cat <laughs> what is this air quality project? Oh, that is something that I want to build on. Um, mm. It's not very like beautiful or artsy. It's just, it was more functional. Um, Secrets. And so I, I bought one of those air quality sensors from Adafruit and um, programmed like a little OLED screen to to show you like the average in the last like three hours or day or whatever you want um and that was mostly just for functional um, like you know when all the forest fires were happening um but i do think it would be really cool to use that code in an art project where you there's like lights there's always got to be lights lights like reacting to the, what the air quality is or something like that i don't mm. know what if you had like a bajillion dollars and all the time in the world uh, is there something that you would build I would love to build a solar system Ooh. of some sort, like just really 
big, maybe for the living room. <laughs> um, I have this vision of like a purple ceiling, like in the living room with a whole LED solar system um, that has all the planets and they're all like individually connected to some sort of sensor. Maybe this incorporates air quality somehow. Um, that would be a big one. And I don't know what material I'd use, but if I had unlimited money, then I could just do anything. <laughs> I love that. Uh, it seems like you could make each planet its own different type of sensor, like air quality and temperature and traffic and <laughs> humidity. Yeah. All the cool sensors, one per planet. That would be cool. <laughs> mm. There is one that, isn't there one that does like leveling an accelerometer and a gyroscope combined somehow would be really cool. I don't know. Ooh, yeah. And then you could have your cat batted around and respond to that. <laughs> yes. Does always. your cat ever get into the, the snake grass? I know they love to eat real plants. <laughs> no, they haven't at all. <laughs> but they do love real plants. That's fortunate. <laughs> what do you think the next tool that you would buy would be to like upgrade your setup? I really want a little miniature Dremel. Oh! Because I have a big one, but um, it's like really bulky. And I, I think having a tiny one would be awesome. Also, there's apparently like all sorts of miniature wood tools out there that I just found out about. Like there's a miniature table saw and a miniature... Oh drill press and like just yeah i've seen some of these in like germany uh in in shops yeah I that, the idea something of like that. Tools. have you seen this cool. mini hot plate from adafruit no i feel like you would love this because i love it it is so tiny and it's so adorable and so useful when you're putting pcbs together um mostly for for surface mount stuff which you tend to do mostly like screw terminals and through hole but like this is a an adorable and very effective little tool. Very much nice. recommended. That looks amazing. <laughs> oh, everybody, you gotta share with us your favorite tiny tools now because Michelle needs some recommendations, and I want to know as a goal to motivate myself to do things. <laughs> do you do that? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Topic change here. You're coming from a software point of view, um, and you've obviously got a GitHub that's quite active with your hardware stuff. Why do you choose to open source your work? Hmm. Um, I never thought of an alternative, I guess. Huh. Um, GitHub is just great and I'm like used to it. And I, I guess I don't see why not. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we obviously are an open source hardware community where people are all sharing their tutorials and you can choose from a bunch of different licenses and stuff so it's interesting to hear like from each person's perspective why they choose to do it and i think that why not is just as good an option as any other one like why not make the default be open source i love it totally and i guess yeah also um i so appreciate it when others post their work because that's how i've learned i mean like hardware stuff i'm totally self-taught so um i want to do that for others if it can be helpful to them <laughs> i love it what is iris detection on here um that is from college so it's i barely remember but it was uh have you heard of processing yeah the, yeah uh it was that and um it was just like an algorithm i wanted to see if i could figure out how to detect an iris mm. um for those who don't know, processing.org is kind of what Arduino's original IDE was based on. Um, it is a sort of design more for, like you were saying, algorithms and sort of um, programming visual stuff. But also you can pull in you know, audio, other sensors and things like that. Um, it's just more of a software based sort of sibling to Arduino. What's the, the coolest hardware thing that you heard about lately? Whether it's you know art stuff, um, automotive, AI, wearables, robotics, home automation. Like, yeah, what's exciting to you in the field right now? Yes. Um, let me just look because I write down everything that I find that I think is awesome. I like save to a list. Oh, nice. Oh, there's some, there's some cool stuff I've been seeing on Hackster about oh, yeah. with, with like using machine learning to detect things with cameras. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's super funny and silly and I love it. 
there's just so many cool things you could do with that and it would be really fun to play with it there's so much weird stuff i i have a hard time looking at these pages because i always get distracted from whatever i'm trying to actually do mm, totally. <laughs> we've got a smart shower timer fire situation monitoring oh, oh man spooky yeah. face falling eyeballs so okay stuff. yeah i gotta i gotta stop looking at this potato <laughs> defender what's going on here okay alex focus <laughs> <laughs> there's so much good stuff mm -hmm. it's a good problem I love this, by the way. This is super cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Your projects are really beautifully documented. Do you have any tips for people um, just to build a well-produced tutorial? Hmm. I Yes, actually. My process for writing out the, the tutorials, which I really, really, really enjoy it. Um, I take pictures as I go. So not really worrying about how I'm going to document it or anything. I just mm -hmm. take lots and lots of pictures and it is a lot of sorting through pictures later. Um, but then I also have this a checklist as I'm building a project. It's mm. like step one, buy the materials, step two, you know, trace them out, whatever. It's like a list of check boxes. So what I do is I copy and paste that list once I'm done with the project into like Hacksher or whatever markdown tool I'm using. And I make those the headers of the write-up. So mm. like each one is kind of a step, like a chunk of thing that I did. Um, and I, I will, I'll rework it. And if one doesn't like make sense in there, I'll take it out kind of thing. Um, but, and then I put, and then I go through the photos and I put them into the right, like under the right header. And so I have this like whole document essentially of headers and photos only and no writing because i find the writing part to be the most challenging um and then i'll go through and i'll add like a few sentences under each header just explaining like what i did or answering questions that i think people might have um and and then yeah that's pretty much it i love it i do a similar thing i think with uh documenting projects where it's just like you know, all the specifics can come later. But even for my own self later on, you know, we don't always finish a project in the first go. I feel like you've actually, you actually seem to be really good at this, but look at this diagram. Ah! But also like when you come back to a project after a couple months or even after a year or so, being able to orient myself with the, the information that I've already put in there just makes it so much easier. And yes, this. totally. Agreed. Beautiful. That's another, yeah, actually that reminded me of another piece of advice I have, which I actually originally got this advice from my brother, who's a writer. And he said to write out the whole thing and then leave it for a week and then come back to it and read it. And then you'll want to edit stuff. And yeah, so giving it time. Mm. So another question for you. You've mentioned on your large installations that they were a collaboration with this group, Salt Mind. And I'm sure that you get a lot of inspiration from each other in the group. Are there other people that, uh, like other artists work that inspires you particularly? Yes. Do you mean specifically in Salt Mind or like just in the world? In the world, especially in terms of electronics and stuff. There are, yeah. Um, I think... The first person I was really inspired by um, is this guy who I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, but Leo Villarreal. Oh, um, you know him? Yeah, he's a San Francisco uh, person. And I think he did the Bay Lights, right? Oh, I don't know. Maybe. But that sounds right. Yeah. Um, I found him because he does. He did a piece at MIT. Um, yeah, this, this his work is just so beautiful um, and super inspiring. He's got so a piece cool. outside the Exploratorium here. Oh, nice. Yeah, his work is really lovely. Oh, yeah, I didn't know he really did this one too. Cool. You know, I bike home past, like underneath that last one every day when I go to the office. Uh, it's right along Howard Street in San Francisco. Huh? Oh, nice. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. I, yeah, I'll have to, next time I'm there, I'll have to check Where it out. This is the out? MIT one, I, I believe. Uh -huh. I just, oops. Yeah, that one. Cool. But I don't know. Your work is so polished, though. I love this. Um, you know, part of the reason that we asked you on is because this this rib cage is just so gorgeous. And I think that it partly comes from this overlap between your your tactile, like physical art interests, and also the uh, the code and the heart electronics parts of it. 
the code really makes them come alive. It's so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love the combo of the two. You talked about uh, being inspired by plants and anatomy. Uh, I have to ask, as someone who loves building companion bots, <laughs> if you were <laughs> to make a robotic companion, do you think you would base it on an animal or a mythical creature or make up something completely different? What do you think it would look like? Oh my gosh. Um, this is not a binding question. You can <laughs> curious. Um man, I I don't know. I haven't thought about this, but I love the idea of it. Um it would be funny to make a plant companion bot. Um, <laughs> oh, I love that. Um man, yeah. Or like a tree. Like a Groot. <laughs> yes, like a Groot. That's yeah, great. totally. Um, but yeah, animals too, or cats. If it was an animal, I think it would be a cat. Mm. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been such a pleasure, and I'm really excited to share your work broad more broadly with our Hackster community. Um, you've already got it published on the site, and uh, we'll be excited to get some more eyes on it uh, because you're making some really, really beautiful projects, and I love how you're bringing them to life with your code. So thank you so much for joining us, Michelle. It's been an awesome time. Yay, thank you. Thanks so much for chatting with me. Cheers!